The first part of the trip was just quiet in the car until part of the 101 highway in California starts turning inland. I remember seeing a big diesel truck veering into my lane. And I went to slam on my brakes and honk the horn, and he just kept coming. The truck looked like it went over her, her whole car and then down in between the two spans of the bridge. It looked like a snake or something going down inside a hole just and disappeared. I suddenly opened my eyes and saw myself looking up to the road above me, and I knew we were dangling off of the side of a bridge. I started screaming, we're gonna fall, we're gonna fall. My daughter's dead, my baby's dying. My name is Kelly Groves, and I'm married. I have three children, Sage, Wilder, and Milo. M-Y-L-O, she's my last one. It's an acronym for, you know, we knew this was gonna be our third child, and she's just completely rounded our family out perfectly. We live in San Juan Capistrano in Southern California. We're just kind of in the middle between San Diego and LA, by the beach and it's really close to my school. I can walk to school every day. I'm a teacher at a school that's in my neighborhood, so all of the kids that I have in my class I get to see after school and on weekends at the grocery store, and they come over and play and have sleepovers, but very tight-knit community. Back in January of 2012, Sage came home from school with a assignment that she had to do research on one of the California missions. Hi, Mom. Hi, Wilder. Hi, Mom. Hey, honey, how was school? Eh. Eh, just eh. Mm-hmm. OK. What's this? I have to write a paper on a California mission. Mm. You know what would be fun? We could take a day trip to San Luis Obispo, and you could see what you're writing about firsthand. OK. All right girls trip. What do you think, Milo, huh? Your first trip. <laughs> it didn't require a field trip to a mission. It was something that she could have researched on the internet. However, because I was on maternity leave, I had the opportunity to actually take her to one of the real missions so she could experience it. My son Wilder was leaving on Friday, the 13th, to go to Reno for a BMX race with my husband. I thought this would be perfect since Wilder will be with Jason. This will be a girl's trip up to San Luis Obispo Mission. Being a teacher, I think that the hands-on experience is what I felt was going to be more memorable for her. And we could get a lot more research out of it and photos and pictures. Hey, sis. Not awesome, my car broke down. I know, I know. <laughs> hey, um, look, I promised Sage I'd take her to San Luis Obispo, part of her school project. Yeah, any chance I could borrow your car for a couple days? Awesome. My mom's okay, car broke I'll down awesome. three weeks before, so we borrowed my aunt's car. Oh, remember, don't roll down the back window. It, it sticks. Okay. okay, you Daddy, guys have fun. Thanks, Carrie. Have a great time. My sister Carrie had a four door BMW. It was a 10, 11 year old car. Very comfortable to drive in. Felt very safe. I had driven it once or twice, but I had never taken it on a long trip before. You girls ready? Mm hmm. Is Ruthie buckled? Yeah. Of course she is. Of course. All right, let's go. Bye, guys.
the first part of the trip was just quiet in the car. Milo slept almost the entire time. We were listening to some music in the car. Sage was singing. We would be chit-chatting. Other times, she would be watching a movie on the laptop in the back seat. Sage was looking forward to this trip because she was going to have just some time with mommy and the new baby with Milo and not have her little brother there. Things really were uneventful until part of the 101 highway in California starts turning inland after driving along the beach through Santa Barbara. And as soon as it started turning inland, there's a rest stop a couple miles in. And we stopped at the rest stop to use the restroom and to eat some lunch. I had put Milo's window down, and I couldn't roll it back up. I thought she said it was that one that didn't work. Yeah, now they're both stuck down. Ugh, I gotta call your aunt. Hey, Carrie. Yeah, um, remember the window you told me not to put down? Yeah, well, I did, and now both of them are stuck down. And she said, what? That one wasn't broken? And I said, well, it's not going up either. And I said, "That's we'll have to figure it out when I get to San Luis Obispo, but we need to get going because we want to get to the mission before it closes. By then, it was after 2 o'clock, and, and we really just wanted to finish the last hour, hour and a half of the trip. After we left the rest stop, Sage put in a movie on my laptop. She couldn't hear the sound because the sound from the wind coming in now, both of the back windows. Mom, I can't hear her. It was just really windy and loud. Uh, use Milo's blanket. Put it over your head, see if that helps. Make your own little movie theater. I had my blanket just over my head, so it would be like a little cave or a little fort. I heard Milo stirring in the back seat and just trying to talk to her, you know, hoping she would go back to sleep for this last hour of, of the trip. Shh. Is she okay? Shh, baby, it's okay. It's okay, honey. Almost there, baby. I knew that if she got cranky and started crying, we would have to stop again, and, and um, we just really wanted to get to where we were going. I remember seeing a big diesel truck cab in front of me. And I remember seeing him veering into my lane. I remember his, seeing his cab coming right over in front of me. And I went to slam on my brakes and honk the horn, and he just kept coming. On January 12th, it was just a normal day for us, a typical Thursday. I was off the following two days, uh, Friday and Saturday, the next day. So I was looking forward to 5 o'clock coming around and I could turn my truck in and go do my own thing. A call came in around 12 noon to go from our city in Santa Maria to Santa Barbara, which is about 70 miles south of us. It was just a tow going to a dealership, so I drove it down there and dropped it off and then started heading back to Santa Maria. The central coast of California, it's a lot of very slight rolling hills. And at that time of year in January, it's very green, and it's a very pretty area, a lot of vineyards and such. As I was heading north, and we're going through these, kind of these rolling little gentle curves in, in the hills, I saw in front of me a small car in the fast lane of the freeway and a semi-truck in the slow lane. 
As we came up on this, uh, one of the curves, they were coming up onto a bridge, I saw the tractor trailer drifting into the small car's lane. And I remember thinking, you know, boy, he's getting awful close. And then he actually hit the car. And my mind was like, oh, there's an accident. An accident's gonna just bump away and it's gonna be over with. But the tractor stayed on the car. They wound up hitting the center divider, the concrete divider for a few feet, and then wound up plowing through the bridge itself. The truck looked like it went over her, her whole car and then down in between the two spans of the bridge, towing the trailer with it. It looked like a snake or something going down inside a hole just, and disappeared. And I just remember putting on my brakes, you know, hitting him a little bit, then hitting him pretty hard. I flipped on all my lights on my truck. And I didn't want anybody else trying to go past me and getting into this, this debris field that's in front of us. With the truck exploded and the car, what was left of it on that bridge, I thought there was nobody was alive. I knew for sure that the driver of the semi truck was gone. The people in the car, I had no idea who was in the car, how many people, but it was just a small mangled piece of metal that was left on there that you couldn't tell what kind of car it was. There was no way that anybody could survive that accident. Come on, come on. California Highway. Hello. Um, there's a huge accident right now, I believe a fatal. Uh, I found a 101, northbound 101. A, um, a semi truck just ran over, just went right through a small um, uh, a BMW. Okay. We are 2.4 miles before fuel tent. There's a fire, and I believe it's a fatal. it must have been that had gone by when I suddenly opened my eyes and saw myself looking up to the road above me. And when I looked down, I could see my feet hanging out of the car and I knew we were dangling off of the side of a bridge. When I looked down, I could see the truck and could feel the heat from then an explosion that came from the truck and I could see the flames and feel the heat under my feet. And the minute I saw that, the, the reality of the situation began to set in and right then I just yelled for Sage. Sage? Sage? Sage, hey! Sage! Sage, honey, we've been in an accident. I didn't have any response, didn't hear anything. I turned my head to the right to look to where she had been sitting in the back seat and there was nothing but mangled metal. The engine was now sitting almost in the passenger seat next to me. I was sitting on the side of the car because the car was hanging sideways. And as I called for Sage and she didn't answer and I couldn't see her, I thought, oh my God, she's been thrown out of the car. It 
it was my day off, and I was in the office that day to give a presentation to the uh, Santa Barbara County Vintners Association. 34 San Luis 1179, report a vehicle versus truck northbound on Highway 101 at Three Bridges. Ambulance we could hear a, a call go out on the radio of a, an 1179, a vehicle accident with an ambulance rolling, and uh, fire involved also at the accident. Ambulances on route. I was on duty. It was my shift. I was responsible for, for anything that happened within the Buellton jurisdiction along US 101. Just after 2.30, we get reports from 911. You get real sketchy details when the initial 911 calls come in, so you really sometimes don't know what you have, but you can hear that something really bad has happened. You're just not sure what it is. 34 San Luis 1179, all available units, please respond. And you could tell from the uh, sense of urgency on the radio that it was a, a major incident. And I walked down the hallway to the back uh, lot of our office. We're only talking maybe two to three miles from the location of where my office is to where this accident was. And when I looked in that direction, that's when I saw it. It looked like a bomb had dropped right on this one area, and it was a plume cloud of black smoke going straight up. I wanted to get to the north side of the bridge because I figured that there's, you know, there's nothing else to do, there's nobody to help, and I didn't want to be stuck by the, um, on, by the firemen and the higher patrol. So I started to slowly drive through the debris field and the smoke to get to the north side of the bridge. Sage and she didn't answer and I couldn't see her I thought is she down there is she down at the bottom of this ravine that was below me no she she must be up on the road somewhere up there because she's not in the car Sage! Sage! so I'm screaming for her and at that at that time I hear the baby screaming in the back God, she's she's hurt too and as I turned my to reach my arm behind me to see if I could feel Milo I saw a small patch of Sage's blonde hair sticking out from the seats and the metal that had been smashed on top of where she had been and to me I thought oh my god she's trapped in there and she's dead so I tapped on her head I said Sage Sage we've been in an accident sweetie it Sage, Sage, do you hear me? Oh my God, somebody help me. And I'm screaming to anybody. After I parked my truck, I started walking towards it. I heard a woman screaming from the car. And then all of a sudden, I thought, oh my God, somebody is alive. There's a lady trapped in the car with her baby. Um, they are dangling over the edge of the rail right now. So is that the okay. BMW? Yes, that's and, in the BMW. Okay, so you can hear her, but you can't see her? Yes, we cannot see her. We can hear her, but we can't see her. She's screaming in there. It's completely smashed over. They're on their way. She was kind of screaming, please hurry, you know, my, my babies are inside. My kids are everything. My kids are my life. Listen to me. Ambulances, fire trucks, police are on their way, okay? Hurry, please, hurry, my little girl! Please. Sir, don't, don't touch the car! No, no, sir, please. don't do that, please. I remember one man was kind of trying to reach maybe into the car to try to feel for the kids. And I remember telling him, you know, stay off the car because we didn't really know how stable the car was. I never saw this man, but I remember his voice. She's still warm. I'm holding her hand, and it's still warm. You 
hear that? They're already on their way. Okay? They're gonna get you guys out of here. I promise you. Hey, look, don't, don't look down. No, look, look right at me. It's gonna be fine. They're almost here. I remember him saying, hear the sirens? They're coming. They're coming. And at that point, I heard her this muffled sound saying, Mom. Mom? 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 <gasps> I was unconscious, and then I woke up. I could see my arms, which were outstretched in front of me. I couldn't see my mom or my sister. I could hear my sister crying, and I could hear um, my mom, but I couldn't really hear what she was saying. Mommy. Mommy. She can't breathe! Please hurry! Sage, I'm here! Sage! Sage! The Highway Patrol seemed to arrive within about probably less than 10 minutes. It seemed like a long time, but I remember telling her, they're here, you know, don't worry, you know, Highway Patrol now has arrived. I remember the firemen all coming out of the trucks and stuff, we could start hearing like a sizzling sound and then pops. And I believe they were probably the tires on the semi truck that were cooking off. They were, you know, heating up and then bursting. Everybody, off the bridge until we get this fire out. Go, 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 go. So I was hearing reports that this was a very, very serious situation. It was very smoky, really, really bad. And of course, traffic was at a standstill, both northbound and southbound on 101. All this stuff that used to be a car was on top of me. I couldn't um, really take a big breath in, so I couldn't really take a big breath out. Mom, help. I hear this, Mom, I can't breathe. And I thought, she has minutes, minutes. And so as I tried to stick my hand in around this little patch of hair through the, through the car seats, I tried to reach my hand in to find where her face was so I could maybe pry the seats a little bit to give her some air. reached my hand back to try to touch Milo because she's still screaming. And when I pulled my hand back, it was dripping in her blood. I didn't know what part of her was bleeding. And in my head, it was her, her head is completely cut open. And she's going to bleed to death if this car doesn't fall before that happens. <laughs> What's the plan? 
we need a full-size crane in here to keep that vehicle from going over while we get them out. It seems to be the only viable plan. I remember talking to one of the battalion chiefs or division chiefs that are on scene that uh, their thoughts were to bring in a crane, a large-sized crane, to stabilize the vehicle from above. I had called it the Department of Transportation because the, the, the bridge was, was relatively destroyed. There's no way I'm certifying a 30-ton crane on this bridge. Both sides took a hit. Whole thing could go down. The Caltrans engineer felt that he would not be able to certify the weight of the crane in that, on that location. They were concerned about a bridge collapse. Well, what are we supposed to do here? This vehicle's going to fall, gentlemen. When I parked my truck on the north side of the bridge, I left it running. A uh, highway patrol officer was next to me. As I was talking to him, my truck started backing up. In that split second, my mind was going, oh, my truck must have popped into gear. What's going on? Oh, it's not up. He just stole that from somebody. It's Pat driving. It's oh, yeah. no, 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 The fire department commandeered his tow truck, and they were basically trying to get that tow truck in position and they didn't know really how to operate the vehicle. I told the CHP officer, uh, I said, you know, do you want me to help him? I go, He's, you know, he doesn't know how to use the wine. He goes, and he said, yeah, go, go, go help him. They asked me to, like, if you have any chains, uh, ropes, chains, straps, anything, get everything we can on this thing to try to make it as stable as possible. The firemen had a lot of ropes, like climbing ropes. So they asked me, actually, can you help us just to find spots to you know, hook onto the car that you think will hold if it does decide to go over. And he basically triangulated the car. So his, his cable went off of the bridge railing and then back across both northbound lanes and he tied off on the back of the BMW. I think it'll hold. For now, for a while, maybe. That's a lot of weight on these lines. My thought was, it'll probably hold okay, but it might just rip in half. We don't have a whole lot of other options right now, or time. I wasn't confident at all that the ropes were gonna hold that BMW up. Basically, this BMW was tied off to the bridge with climbing ropes. It was a heavy vehicle. Looking down and seeing where this car is going to be any minute now, having Milo crying in the back seat, having Sage not being able to breathe, it was, I remember thinking, oh, this is real, and this is what it's like when a parent loses a child and witnesses it and, and lives through it, and then I'm, that's, and then I'm going to die as well, and then I have my son at home with my husband, and, and this can't be happening. This cannot, this can't happen like this. And I just screamed for everyone to help in some way, and no one could do anything because of where we were hanging off of this bridge. engine gets there. The fire was just being put out, so it's still smoky. You could see Kelly hanging off the bridge in her car, and then engine 31's crew trying to cut out Sage and get to Milo. looked like a dripping chunk of metal, you know, that was gonna fall. Yeah, I've been a firefighter for 19 years. Probably one of the worst car accidents I've seen in my career. From talking to the division chief on scene, I know that there is a young woman and her two young children in the vehicle. Uh, the division chief described the woman and one of the children as severely injured and believed that the infant child in the car might be dead because the child was unresponsive at that time. 
I look over at the, the incident command post on the southbound lanes, and I see my commander is on scene. So I decided to text her the situation uh, status report. So I texted Lorraine that the vehicle had two uh, severely injured occupants and one baby that they suspected was dead. I'll never forget Lorraine looking across. It was probably 60 feet between the two bridges and we met eyes. Can you believe this? You know, we were both scheduled to retire soon. Lorraine was gonna retire in August and I was gonna retire at the end of the year. And what a way to end our careers with uh, a dead infant, a dead child. around the top of Milo's car seat somehow because I remembered her window was down. I had this fear that somehow that car seat wasn't going to hold her and that in the, in the crash that she would fall out of the window, out of the car seat, or the car seat would fall out completely. could do anything because of where we were hanging off of this bridge and I knew it was completely hopeless I, I knew there is there, this is the end this is this isn't right this isn't how you know Sage who was so full of life I'm never gonna hear her singing again I'm never gonna see her smiling um, her belly laugh that she has and Milo has no idea at 10 weeks old what life even is and should this car fall right now that sensation, she's not even going to be able to understand any of it, and um, it was com just complete terror. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. My dad had passed away about six months before, very suddenly. And I just remember saying to him, but Dad, please don't take my girls. <laughs> Wherever you are, you don't need them. I need them here. They are my life. Please don't take them. <laughs> I felt that that was just the only person that would be able to, to save us in some way. <sighs> I could keep feeling the baby. I would start tapping on her, her chest, or I'd slap her cheeks, stick fingers in her mouth, some way to get a reaction. And then I'd feel her stir and start crying. I'd think, OK, she's OK now. And then back to Sage and, and trying to just find some sense of life in both of them. Sage, honey. And I remember someone, firefighter up on the, on the bridge. OK, we're going to try, try to tie up your car and hold it. We're, we're tying up your car right now to hold it stable, OK? We're getting you out. Do what we can. You're doing good. And I just said, you have to get my daughter Sage out of here. She's dying. Um, she can't breathe. And we're going to fall. Just hurry, hurry. Please get us out of here. And he said, well, you know, we're, we're going to try. We're doing the best that we can. Hi, Kelly. I'm Greg. We're going to get you out of there, OK? Please, Greg, you have to save my kids. Don't let them die in here. 
she was crying, scared to death, but was able to talk. You know, she, she hadn't lost control of herself or anything. But it was, if you can imagine, I mean, you don't even know if your kids are alive. You don't even know if you're gonna live. And you don't, you don't know if you're gonna get out or how you're gonna get out. I think you could just tell that it was overwhelming for her, you know? Don't let us fall, don't you let us fall, please. Please, please. Her most important thing were her kids. Her most important thing. I think I'm gonna throw up. That's okay. You go right ahead and throw up if you need to. And he had said, my name is Greg, and I'm gonna fill you in every step of the way as we, as we try to get you and your girls out of here. Please save my kids. Please save my baby. She was like 10 weeks older. I mean, she was little, Milo was. I can't, I can't live without them. Kelly, she was a mother of three with a brand new baby. And then this whole thing about ready to go, it had to be terrifying for her. I, I honestly, I don't know how her mind, you know, even was able to comprehend all that. I was in and out. You get really dizzy and your vision's kind of fuzzy. You like feel like the room's spinning and then you come to and you don't know how long it's been since you were in the last time and then you go back out again. Sage, honey, can you hear me? Sage, honey, can you hear me? Say help, say help if you can hear me, baby. I can hear you, Mom. Help. Good job, honey. Say help, okay? Sage would go quiet. And I thought, oh my God, I, I, she's dead. She's not answering me now. She's not answering me. And I'd start tapping that part of her head again. And then I'd hear this little help, help. And I'd go, okay, she, she's talking again. She's talking again. I can hear you, Mom. I thought I'm gonna like stop breathing because I can't breathe enough and I might die. Nobody knew if Sage was alive or dead. I mean, you know, you would hear groaning. She would respond to maybe simple sort of questions, but there were a lot of spaces in between when she would talk. And so you didn't have this constant dialogue from her, so you didn't know if there was a dead kid or a live kid in there. And they were cutting out to see if it was. hear um, like orders being shouted back and forth. I could hear like metal scraping and which is like them trying to pull pieces off the car. Mommy! Mommy! <laughs> so you can spread metal and you can cut metal. There's also kind of what we call ram bars and you can push metal. Basically they're trying the best they can to cut spread or push this metal away from Sage without compromising any more injuries in a vehicle that's almost made to be indestructible in a location that's very dangerous. I could hear people say, it's going to fall. Um, and I was like, what are they talking about? I heard my mom say it a couple times, we're going to fall, we're going to fall. And I was like, I don't even understand. What do you mean, fall? I had no idea there was any bridge near us. I remember one of the firemen saying, we have to stop. We have to stop. The car's, the car's gonna fall. What? <gasps> no, you, you can't stop! You can't stop, please! Please don't stop! You can't give up because Age is still alive and she's trying to fight here and you, you have to give her a chance. You, you can't just give up because she's not giving up. At that point, I saw one of the firemen's faces and he sighed and, and I remember him looking at one of his fellow firefighters 
and said, whatever we do, we have to do it fast because we're losing this one. Don't say that! I can hear you, okay? Don't say that! She's fighting, she's fighting so hard! You can't say that. I can't hear you. It's just a crumbled up ball of metal. How can anybody survive this? Inside was 10 week old Milo. We weren't sure if she was alive. Don't tell me she's dying. Just get us out of here already! For whatever reason, a big rig tractor trailer uh, was passing uh, a small car on the right lane when it suddenly veered out of control. <laughs> went into the bridge railing, destroyed it, and then went down to the creek bed where it, it, uh, where it burst in the flames and left Kelly Grove's blue BMW impaled on the bridge railing. When you look at the car, you're, you're wondering how can anybody survive this because it's, it's basically just a crumbled up ball of metal. All this damage from, from this accident had collapsed around this car seat and inside was 10 week old Milo and we weren't sure if she was, uh, was alive or if she was deceased. Sage had basically been crushed by that truck when the truck ran her over. She had been crushed on the back seat of that car and was basically suffocating. At this point, they're becoming, I wouldn't say desperate in their attempt to get into the car, but I would say that they're deploying methods I've never seen before. I actually watched as they took a ladder and put it across the uh, span between the two bridges, and I think they were even contemplating having one of their firemen go out on this ladder in an attempt to cut into the vehicle. I remember one of the firemen saying, whatever we do, we have to do it fast because we're losing this one. And I told him, I said, I heard you say that. You, you can't, you have to get her out. Don't tell me she's dying. Don't tell me you're losing her because I can't even imagine her leaving me. And I, I think that I was giving up at that point. And knowing that Sage wasn't going to make it, and, and even if we made it out of here, that I couldn't wake up tomorrow without her. Please just get us out of here already! Stop shaking so hard! Please call my husband! Just call my husband! Come on, she's dying! All these thoughts and ideas. She can't even really comprehend them all. Thoughts like, are my kids alive? She was saying things too, like, you need to call my husband. I mean, all these things are going through her head, right? All these things. I think I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't live without them. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> Kelly. While I was sitting there talking to Kelly, I thought of a family friend who was really good at giving pep talks and kind of got you to focus on sort of your task at hand and, you know, motivate you. And so I thought of him in that moment, and a little bit of that came back to me. You gotta be strong right now. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can't live without them. Kelly, I can't. you gotta dig deep down inside and find the strength to fight for your girls. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. He had said to me, you need to dig deep down inside and and find strength to fight for your girls. And that hit me really, really hard to think that this isn't about this car falling. If it falls, I, what can I, I can't do anything. All I can do is keep Sage and Milo alive as long as I can. And my thinking started switching to just going minute by minute. It's gonna be okay, okay? They're gonna get you out. 
I like to hope that that kind of helped Kelly focus on some things or turn a corner where she could focus on being a mom and let this rescue, all this other crap that she was thinking of, just get dealt with by someone else. <laughs> Milo. Milo, mommy's here. Shh. At this minute, I can touch Milo's chest and I can feel her heart beating, so I know she's still here. And at this minute, Sage is answering me when I call her. And that's all that matters because right now she's alive and she's still with me. And every minute mattered to me. I had noticed a group of military vehicles stopped in traffic just north of the accident scene in the southbound lanes. There was a group of about eight of them, and they were watching the rescue attempt from that location. On Thursday, January 12, 2012, my group of Seaweeds and I were traveling back from our training exercise and came upon an accident. So much for making it home tonight. Look at this. A CB is a construction engineer, a side of the Navy that not very many people know about. Might as well stretch our legs, go out a look. We were able to see that this car was slipping off the more and more that the car was being cut apart. That also added a sense of urgency to be able to get everybody out. And we knew we had to do something because we had something that we knew would work. Come on. Excuse me, officer. Officer. What are you guys, Army? CBs, sir, Navy Construction. Look, I think we can help you guys out. I've, I've got a forklift on my truck a ways back, and I think- Forklift? Yeah, maybe you guys can direct traffic back there. Get some of these cars turned around for us. Uh, yes, sir. We'd be more than happy to help direct traffic. But what I was saying... We had a forklift sitting a couple hundred yards back on a trailer that would work out perfectly for putting this car back on the road so that the emergency rescue crews could get the people out. And we knew we had to do something because we had something that we knew would work. We just didn't feel like our word got across. All right, look, get the forklift off the truck. Be ready to show them what we can do, all right? About 30 or 45 minutes went by, and we saw the struggle of everybody trying to be pulled out of the vehicle. We, we are dads, and that kind of gave us a sense of, you know what, we got to do something. We, we all have young children at home. We need to do something. Because we had something that we knew would work. We just didn't feel like our word got across. We don't like to use equipment that hasn't been vetted. Everything that we use at a, at a scene has already been tested. So we don't like to go outside of what is tried and true with us. Sir, can I help you? Pardon me, sir, I think I'm the one who's here to help you. I've got a construction forklift with a telescoping arm just down the road. I asked the man, I said, what kind of equipment do you have? And he said, I have a forklift. And I said, I kind of laughed to myself. I said, how is a forklift? Because I'm imagining the forklift that they use at Costco and thinking, how is a forklift going to help me at this scene? He says, no, no, I have an industrial sized forklift that we use to load and unload heavy equipment. I, th I think we can stabilize this wreck from the other side of the bridge, give these guys a chance to get those girls out of there. What do you say? Let's do it. And I said, let's, let's do it. Let's go.
<laughs> the car still was not secure. I could feel it moving and jolting every time they tried to cut some part of off the off the outside of the car. But I could feel extreme pain in in my hip area and um, and I tried moving my legs and I, I couldn't move them. It hurt to move them and I felt crackling of bone and I thought, oh, I, I know my pelvis is broken. Craig, Craig, please save my kids. Please, please, you have to get them out of here. Don't let them die. Please don't, don't you let us fall. Please. Being with a patient for that long and it going that slow, it does get uncomfortable. You are constantly, you know, reassuring. And then at some point, you sort of have to start reassuring yourself, like, is this going to go, you know, how we planned? Because it took a long time. It's a life and death situation. Time was going by very slow. I had actually run up to the trailer. There was like a little bit of hesitation. The forklift was all unchained, and I was sitting there. Nobody really knew what, what to do afterwards. They, everybody froze. And I, I just took it upon myself to jump in the forklift. After the accident happened, I noticed this group of CBs. You see behind them coming a forklift. I've worked construction, and when I saw that, I knew that we're okay. This is perfect. This is the tool they needed. The public perception of a forklift probably is something that lifts pallets. This is a military forklift, really kind of funky looking with big tires. It's green but it has these forks that extend out uh, 20, 25 feet. The truck had hit the side railing of the southbound lanes and had punched a big hole in the side of the guardrail. And so what this forklift driver did is he positioned himself at the perfect angle to the car and he just pushed the blades of that uh, forklift right through the hole that the truck had already made. I just felt like I had to be real smooth. I didn't want to get my emotions mixed up with it. If you get your emotions mixed up with it, it's harder to focus, and then you make mistakes. But it was more of, this is the operation that I have to do, not the fact that I was holding a car up or that there were people in the car. I remember seeing this jagged tooth coming in underneath where my feet were hanging out of the car. Stop, stop the forklift, her feet, you're gonna crush her feet. And someone had said, stop, stop, her feet are there. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll try to move my feet. And I reached under my legs and, and tried to lift my legs up so this tooth could come underneath where my feet were. No, no, it's okay, I, can, I think I can move them. They had me place my forks right underneath the car just to where it barely made contact with the car because there was a fear that if I did lift it, that it would cause more harm to everybody in the vehicle still. Sage had basically been crushed by that truck when the truck ran her over. She had been crushed in the back seat of that car and was basically suffocated. Don't see Sage. And that was the A number one priority. The vehicle was stable, although it was still precarious. Kelly was conscious. Mila was still breathing. Kelly could touch her. But Sage, it was the unknown.
still not having any idea of what this plan was with the forklift, I, I thought maybe they would try to lift the car back over the bridge. And then once it was there, um, I remember someone saying, okay, we can, we can keep cutting now. told me to keep talking, so I just kept saying help, help, over and over in this almost rhythm. Help. 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 Sage's body was somewhere buried inside of all the metal, and I see this speck of blue sky, and I knew that they had taken some big piece off of the car. And if I could see them, then they could see me and they could see where Sage was. And someone saying, I see her, I see her. Very quickly, as soon as that happened, I see them pulling Sage through this little worm-like hole and seeing her limp body just being twisted and pulled out, and then she was gone. from the helicopter, and off she went. They started to wheel her past me. There was a doll that Sage had with her that fell off, like, right in front of me. And I remember thinking to myself that, that she, oh my God, she dropped her doll, she's gonna want that. I grabbed the doll, and I remember tapping one of the firemen on the back of his jacket, and he didn't respond at first. So then I remember tapping him harder because it's a big, heavy jacket that the firemen wear. She so didn't want that. You could tell she was really, really scared, and you could tell she was hurt. I watched as they loaded her in the helicopter, and then I continued to watch the rescue from there. And of course, I was very concerned for what was gonna happen next. I couldn't hear Kelly screaming and crying because the, the noise that the forklift makes, the noise that the, the um, uh, jaws of life makes, it's real loud. So I couldn't hear her communicating with the firemen. I couldn't hear it at all. The chief had told me that this baby was unresponsive and I was, kind of preparing myself for when we were going to take the baby out. Any, uh, any word on the baby? We knew that the next one to come out was the 10-week-old baby. So I asked the CHP officer, I said, do you know, do you know how the baby is? What's, what's with the baby? And he just kind of shook his head no. And at that time, <laughs> Excuse me a second. And at that moment, my mind is thinking, oh my God, I got to get out of here. I don't want to see a dead baby. I do not want to be here. I don't want to see this. But again, the, you know, the way your mind, my mind works, there is like, you know what? It'll suck it up. You have this little job to do, and just do your job. And whatever happens, happens, and you'll deal with this later. 
somebody's counting on you to do this. Somebody's counting on you to finish this up and just finish it up. The firemen couldn't get the baby to talk. They didn't hear the baby. Um, they couldn't reach in or feel the baby or nothing, so nobody really knew if the baby was alive or not. It was not responsive, so either the baby is sleeping or the baby's gone. And that was the only information we had. Hey, how safe is it to go out on the arm of that thing? One of the firefighters had asked if he would be able to climb out on the forks and use that as a platform to work off of. And we were like, yeah, absolutely, as long as you're tied off. hanging off of our side of the bridge and was standing on this forklift. And through that back window that had been rolled down, he was able to get in. He said, OK, you're going to have to let go of her now, though, because I was still holding on to the car seat. OK, Kelly, I'm going to get Milo out now, but you're going to have to let go of her. Okay. It's OK, Kelly. I'm not going to drop your baby. It's all right. Uh, Kelly has her hand on Milo. I'm like, wow, how are you going to tell him? Well, I'm like, hey, I'm going to take your baby out of this car right over this ravine, and I'm going to lift it up, so just let go. He had cut the straps away, and I had this intense panic of, oh, my God, he's going to drop her. And I said, can you please wrap her in some kind of net or something? Um, don't drop her. Don't drop her. And he said, I'm not going to drop her. Getting to Milo, it was almost like reaching down into a little hole or, or like a big bucket or something, right? And there just wasn't a lot of room to work in there. And a lot of times, <clears throat> harnesses or rescue systems or components will get put onto patients to extricate them, to pull them out. There was really no room to do that. There's Milo in her car seat, undid the buckle, took off my gloves. People were handing me stuff, and I literally set it aside. I made a decision to hang on as tight as I could and just lift her up, you know? Here we go. Oh, and he pulls this baby out. The baby's eyes were closed, which I expected because I'd been told that she was unresponsive, so I was expecting the worst. And when Knuckles pulled her out, he popped her straight up in the air. And when he did, her little hand shot out like that, and her eyes popped wide open. Mama. I had this enormous, just almost a sigh of, of gratitude and, and sense that even if I don't make it, they are, they are safe. And that's, I did my job and I kept my girls alive. We had another sigh of relief that somebody else was pulled out of the car. But Kelly, I saw her in the car still and I was like, well, we're not done yet. Kelly, do you think you can get yourself 
Up through out there, we got Sage out. Ah, I get, uh, no, I can't, I can't move my legs. They said, well, we're, do you want to come out the way Sage came out, or do you want to come out the front of the car? And I looked at this tiny hole that they had pulled Sage out of, and I said, I can't move my legs. There is no way I can get out from that. I think I need to go out this way. Okay. There you go. That's it. That's it. Right here. Okay. The firefighters had laid this big, thick blanket so I wouldn't get cut on all the shards of metal and glass that was in front of me. And Greg was turning my feet, trying to help from the bottom while they pulled my arms up through the top. Getting Kelly out, she almost climbed out on her own, honestly. It's all we could do to have her, like, not climb out on her own. The only thing I could say was, how sage, how sage. They said, well, she's in, we only have two helicopters, and she's in one of them, and, and there she goes right now. And as they're wheeling me toward my helicopter, I see a helicopter going over my head. There goes Sage. And we're putting you on the next one. What? No, no, that needs to be for Milo. Milo needs to go first. Kelly. And I said, well, why are you putting me in the helicopter? What about Milo? And one of the paramedics said, she seems to be fine. And we only have two. And out of the three of you, she is the least hurt. And so we're going to put her in an ambulance and drive her. And I said, that's impossible. She was covered in blood. No, take, take her in the helicopter. There's got to be something wrong with her. And they said, she seems to have just a couple scrapes on her head, and we need to get you there first. So I was in no position to fight with them. She gets out, and she gets on the gurney. And the first thing I noticed about Kelly is, you know, when I looked at the two kids, you couldn't see any immediate signs of injury. When I looked at Kelly, it was obvious that there was something severely wrong. Because the top portion of her body was angled off of the bottom portion of her body. So it was almost like she was trying to lay on her side, but her legs were flat on the gurney. It was like somebody had twisted her body in half like that. continued to say, how is Sage? How is Milo? Um, I'm laying in the emergency room with doctors, stitching up my elbow that had been cut, my knee. I was very much alert and mechanical, like a machine. The doctors were asking me questions, and I could answer them. What's your name? What's your phone number? Date of birth? I could just rattle the answers off. It was almost as if um, I had kicked into some other mode. How's Milo? I, when can I see her? Oh, Milo's fine. She just had a few scratches. Okay? How, what about Sage? How, how is she doing? Sage is still in surgery. Other than broken bones, tests are coming back fine. Okay? Okay. okay. I want to see him. I want to see my girls. I know you do. Okay. Is my husband here yet? I need to, I need to talk to my husband. I said, you need to call my husband. His name is Jason. He's home with my son. And please call my sister, Carrie. Um, it was her car, and they need to come up here. Don't you want milk with that? The person kept calling our home phone, and we didn't know who it was, so we didn't answer it. Then when it started calling my dad's phone, he picked it up and answered it, and they said that um, your wife and your kids got in a fender bender. Hello? What? Jason had asked the doctor, well, are they OK? And the doctor said, well, Sage has a broken leg, um, 
but you need to come up here. And my husband said, well, we're going that direction tomorrow, Friday, anyway, for a BMX race up in Reno. So can we just stop by in the morning? And at that point, the doctor said, no, you need to come now, and I highly recommend someone drive you. Right after Kelly got pulled out of the car, uh, the firefighters asked us to hold on for a minute so that they could get all their ropes and everything picked up. And then they wanted us to put the car back on the road. The stressful stuff was all done. I just lifted and then pushed the car back on the road. I was grateful that we were able to offer what we had and it saved people's lives. I just wish we would have done something sooner been a little more persistent. They could have fallen down over the edge of the bridge and died. I don't remember what time it was that I got home, but I know it was late. My wife and son were waiting at home. I hugged my child extra tight, just valuing the importance of life and then how fast it can be taken from you. It was, just, it was just a relief that they finally got out. You know, it, it was two hours of sitting there, hoping that everybody was alive, and then finally getting them out, ugh, you know, taking a big breath all of a sudden. Now it was just a matter of cleanup, you know? Let me get my stuff and go back home. <laughs> to the hospital, my dad figured out that it just wasn't a fender bender. It was a bad accident. How could she still be in surgery? Her injuries are more extensive than we previously thought. I'm afraid it's more than just broken bones. When Jason got there, he walked into the emergency room, and the doctor said, well, Sage is in surgery. And Jason said, but she was in surgery four hours ago. How could she still be in surgery? and the doctor began filling him in on the extensive injuries that Sage had. It wasn't just a broken leg. This is exactly what I was afraid was going to happen, is that we made it and I'm going to lose her now. Her injuries are more extensive than we previously thought. I'm afraid it's more than just broken bones. The doctor began filling him in on the extensive injuries that Sage had. It wasn't just a broken leg. Her pelvis had been shattered. Her femur was smashed. They had to insert a rod. Her tendons on her left foot were slashed, so she had no movement in her foot. She had over 100 stitches throughout her body from where glass had just cut up. Hi, honey. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. I'm okay. I had a shattered pelvis. Other than that, it was just a few stitches on my knee and my elbow. Um, couldn't believe that that was all that had happened to me as well. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> my night nurse, Kim, she said, well, I can take you down and see Sage. And I thought, how do you, I can't move. I, you know, I'm in bed and, and I, and she said, I'll just wheel the bed down. And I just remember being very dark, and um, and I see Sage, who looked so tiny in this big hospital bed. And she had tubes, but her face was not a single scratch on her face. She still had that beautiful glow. And she could just look at me with her eyes, and I could just, I could just tell from her she was 
still so scared. And I could hold her hand. Um, and then she would go to sleep. She was, you know, just completely traumatized. But um, she was she was alive. Milo was released 24 hours after she was admitted with four scratches on her head, no stitches, nothing else. No one came out of this accident without some type of scar, including Ruthie, who was left with a black burn mark from something in the car. Jason didn't understand the magnitude of, of this until he was sitting the next morning at the hospital and there was a newspaper and on the front page was a picture of the car hanging off of the bridge with me in it. hospital seeing her crying and stuff and I was like why are you crying and when I said I sorry we trashed your car she ended up laughing oh remember don't roll down the back window it it sticks okay, okay. You my sister was newly out of law school and she decided to get old blue as she called it, as she called it it was a 2001 dark blue four-door BMW. My dad said, I can't believe you'd spend that much money on a car. That's more than my first house cost. And it went on and on just lending, you know, my sister any advice that he had and how you could still take it back. <laughs> and my sister said, Dad, someday this car will save my life. My sister, Carrie, completely remembers that conversation. And as soon as this accident happened, she actually went back to that conversation. It didn't save my life, but it saved three. Once the rescue had been accomplished, the investigation really begins. We have to put all the information and evidence together to make a determination of what caused this collision. The determination was made by the lab that the driver had nearly four times the amount of methamphetamines that you typically see in someone who abuses methamphetamine. There is no doubt that, uh, th that this driver was highly impaired, and because he was highly impaired, he caused this, this terrible collision. I don't have any anger but I still feel very sad that someone had to die when someone didn't have to die. I wasn't aware of what movie Sage was watching until a few weeks later. The laptop she was watching was recovered from the car. My friend was able to extract the DVD, and at that point, I had looked and saw the movie she was watching was a series of unfortunate events. And that still sends shivers. <laughs> this was a series of unfortunate events, absolutely. However, at the same time, what has come since then is, has been a series of extremely fortunate events. For everything to fall into place like it did, everything had to happen perfectly. If this terrible, terrible accident had happened even five minutes later, the Seabees wouldn't have been there. I'm glad they got delayed because we needed them and we're thankful that they were there. Sometime in the summer of 2012, Kelly threw a barbecue for all the responders that were at the scene 
and she came to thank each one of us. I knew that this was perhaps my only opportunity to tell them and show them beyond words, thank you for giving me my family. A very good friend of mine called me to check on me when I was recovering. And he said, Kelly, do you understand what you have? And I said, what do you mean? I didn't understand what he was getting at. And he said, you have tomorrow. You have weddings. You have graduations. You have grandchildren. And I thought, this is so much more than just thank you for being in the right place at the right time to the CBs, or thank you firefighters for doing your job. This was so beyond that. This was, this was giving me my, my tomorrows and my children's tomorrows. And this was giving me listening to them argue. And this was um, giving me, you know, future prom dates for my girls and broken hearts and all the amazing things that I don't have to mourn is what these rescuers gave us. Sunday Fun and Games kicks off with a new Celebrity Family Feud tomorrow. In a split second, I realized the ground was moving. The only thing I had time to do was just hang on. A college tradition.